Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Quilt Fiction Podcast, where our motto is quilt, read, repeat. I'm your host, Frances O'Rourke Dow. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm a novelist who writes about quilts. I'm also a children's book author and a quilt journalist. For more about my writing life, you can check out my author website, francisdow.com. Today's quilt fiction episode is brought to you by Aliso, home of cutting edge fabric tools tailored to the needs of quilters and sewists. Aliso has generously provided this month's giveaway goodies, the TJ1600 Pro Plus Autolift Iron, the M2 Pro Travel Iron, and a fabulous ironing board cover. By the way, I've got the Autolift Iron and it is super cool. You have until March 1st, 2024 to enter the giveaway. Just go to the Quilt Fiction homepage, which is quiltfiction.com, and sign up for your chance to win. In this month's episode, we have a wonderful interview with novelist Sandra Dallas. While Sandra never set out to write quilt fiction per se, she has clearly got a heart for quilts. In novels such as The Persian Pickle Club, Alice's Tulips, and The Diary of Maddie Spencer, among many others, she brings us characters who make quilts as part of their everyday lives. As you'll hear in the interview, Sandra is adamant that women have never just quilted to be practical. They've also made quilts as a way of expressing themselves creatively and artistically, a sentiment that I fully share. By the way, Sandra's The Persian Pickle Club is Quilt Fiction's February Book of the Month, and we'll be giving a copy away to one lucky winner. Same instructions as earlier. Go to quiltfiction.com and enter to win. Okay, before we go to the interview, which I recorded with Sandra in mid-January, I want to let you know that there's always a lot going on at the Quilt Fiction website. There's lots of free stuff, audio stories and stories you can read online. There's also a shop where if you want to buy my books, you can buy my books, which include the novel Birds in the Air and the story collection, Margaret Goes Modern, and also the audiobook of Friendship Album, 1933. Now, Friendship Album is currently only available as an audiobook, but we hope to have the print version out this summer, which I am so, so excited about. So stay tuned for more news about that. Finally, if you want quilt fiction audio stories in your email box every week, along with access to a huge archive, really big archive of quilting stories and novels available to members only. You can sign up for my patron-supported Story Guild podcast and community for only $6 a month. That's a lot of fiction. If you're not ready to make a commitment, try our $10 a month membership. Cancel at any time or switch over to the annual membership, and, um, and you can try things out and see what you think. Okay, on with the show. Here is a brief introduction to Sandra Dallas. New York Times bestselling author Sandra Dallas was dubbed, quote, a quintessential American voice, end quote, by Jane Smiley and Vogue magazine. Sandra's novels, with their themes of loyalty, friendship, and human dignity, have been translated into a dozen foreign languages and have been optioned for films. A journalism graduate of the University of Denver, Sandra began her writing career as a reporter with Business Week. A staff member for 25 years and the magazine's first female bureau chief, she covered the Rocky Mountain region, writing about everything from penny stock scandals to hard rock mining, Western energy development to contemporary polygamy. Many of her experiences have been incorporated into her novels. Turning to fiction in 1990, Sandra has published 18 novels, including Westering Women and four young adult books, the latest Someplace to Call Home. 
Sandra is a six-time recipient of the Women Writing the West Willa Award. She has won the Willa Award for New Mercies, The Bride's House, True Sisters, A Quilt for Christmas, another really wonderful book of hers, Hard Scrabble, and the aforementioned Some Place to Call Home. Sandra lives in Denver and Georgetown, Colorado with her husband, Bob, and she is the mother of two adult daughters whom she's very proud of. Now, on with the interview. Sandra Dallas, welcome to the Quilt Fiction Podcast, and thank you so much for being here. We're going to talk about your novels in a minute, but we want to start talking, uh, start out by talking about quilts. And I'm curious, are you a quilt maker? I was when my children were little and I was considered very good, but then other women started quilting and it was uh, evident that I was not very good. I made a quilt for my sister, one of those uh, things where you have a a big uh, uh, patch on the top and you stuff it underneath with, with, uh, um, with cotton. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know when to stop stuffing. And the weight weight the quilt weighed twenty five pounds, so I don't really consider myself a quilter, but I <laughs> am someone who loves quilts. Well, that's what in in, in a recent quilt folk article, the Colorado issue, and you are talking to us from Denver, Colorado. We were recording this; um, it won't be live on the podcast. But in the Colorado issue of Quilt Folk, you mentioned that you collect quilts, and I would love to hear about the quilts you've collected. Why you pick up a quilt, um, if, if you have any good quilt stories around the quilts that, that are in your collection. I don't have any particular way of collecting them. If I see something I like, I buy it. I did collect doll quilts for a long time, um, starting with the one that, that my grandmother had made for my sister. Um, because big quilts take a lot of room, mm -hmm. and you can store a lot of doll quilts in a, a drawer. I eventually gave them to the Rocky Mountain Quilt Museum, but I have saved many of the quilts that mean something to me. My favorite, I think, is one that my mother purchased in Harveyville, Kansas in 1933 or four. My, um, a woman across the road had made the quilt. My mom and dad were living on my uh, dad's parents' farm. They had both lost their jobs, and so they had gone to the farm. Um, to live. They had just been married. Mother got a job in Washington, D.C., and she was uh, um, packing to, um, uh, she was packing to go. She had seen this quilt, and the neighbor said that um, she wanted $10 for it, and Mother couldn't afford it. The night before Mother left, the neighbor came over and said, would you pay $7? And mom said, yes, that she thought she could do that. And when mom told me the story, she said, "It the quote was worth so much more, but I just didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. And she always felt a little guilty about it. It was a flower basket quilt. And it was it was used for years, but it's still in very good condition. And on special occasions, I put it out. Uh -huh. Now, did your mother quilt? Did your mother sew? Tell us a little bit. Actually, now I'm very intrigued by your childhood. Did you grow up in Kansas or? No, I grew up in Colorado. My okay. grandmother, who lived in Kansas, quilted, but she made quilts with uh, out of uh, oh, patches from worn out pants. And they were very heavy and, and not very attractive. I remember sleeping under them, but they were warm. Mm. Uh, Mom made one quilt when she lived on the farm in Kansas. It was a wedding ring quilt. And my sister has that. It's very, very ragged. Um, so nobody in the family much quilted. My uh, other grandmother was a beautiful seamstress, but I don't know that she ever quilted. And so, I, I don't know why I, I developed an interest in them. I I like quilts because they are women's art. Mm. They were made at a time when women were not pursued, were not encouraged to pursue fine arts. And so they put artistry in their own work. You see that in Pennsylvania Dutch uh, um, 
furniture that the women made and the paintings they did on it. And in quilts, you, you could very easily make a quilt out of great big patches of fabric, and it would serve the purpose of keeping somebody warm. But instead of doing that, women used uh, uh, intricate designs and made these beautiful quilts that we treasure today. Mm -hmm. are, are, is there a particular kind of quilt that catches your eye right away? I've always thought, well, cabin quilts. I don't know why, um, but I like the idea that that little center represents the, um, it's always red, and it represents the hearth of the home. Mm. Now, you said that, um, I think, that the, were you made, did you start making quilts when you had children, or is that when your quilt-making career culminated and <laughs> burned out in a blaze of glory? <laughs> I started when my children were babies. And I, I don't know why. I just thought it would be kind of fun to do. I like the quilts. I think that's a very common story. Um, I, I've been involved with the Quilt Alliance for a long time, and we collect oral histories from quilters. And so many people say, I made my first quilt when I had a baby. And it, it seems uh, almost, in some people, just an automatic response. I have a child. I must make this child a quilt. And they were not peace quilts. What, we, what I did was buy fabric that had pictures of some sort on it or butterflies or mm -hmm. something like that. And then I just quilted around those oh. and, uh, rather than using pieces uh -huh. uh, and, and make little quilts that way. Would you put the quilt together, the the backing and the the, the batting, and then at that point quilt? So yes, yes. Interesting. And do you have those quilts still? Are they still part of you? I have one of them still. I think I gave the others away, or they wore out, uh, and then I turned to piecing quilts. And was the twenty five pound quilt? <laughs> A beast quilt, or was it one that you filled up? No, it was one of those puff quilts. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I, I used to go to antique shows and buy quilt tops. And you could buy them for $15. Yeah. Um, and very often they were beautifully done things, but they were probably uh, made by somebody who had died and and uh, uh, or put into put in yard sales or some such mm -hmm. thing. And uh, but I, I really did make some nice quilts and, and got credit for somebody else's work. Yeah. <laughs> well, and when you bought those quilt tops, was your sense that you were saving them from obscurity or did they speak to you artistically? And you thought, I would like to bring this home and and, and, and continue it. It's on its journey. I think a little of both. Mm. Um, I like the idea of. Uh, they, they're mostly period pieces, sometimes 1930s with lots of polka dots on them and and other times older quilts. And and I felt in a way that I was saving them, but I also thought they were pretty and I wanted to use them on the bed. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this uh, perhaps leads us a little bit into your books, because I think you primarily write, if not entirely write, historical fiction. Is that correct? I do now. Yeah. Now, I've written 18 uh, adult novels and, and five children's books. And are they all historical fiction or is there any contemporary fiction? They're all historical. Now when I think about it. Yeah. yeah. Now, you, and you did you start out as a reporter? I was a reporter for Business Week magazine for 25 years. I was Denver bureau chief. Oh, okay. And I covered the mountain states and, and, um, um, and even once did a piece on quilting. Do you remember what it was about? Yes, it was about, I went back to Harveyville, Kansas, and sat in with a quilt group. Some of the women remembered my grandmother. And I remember one, one said, I remember when your grandmother was bitten by a rattlesnake when she was picking peas, beans, in uh, 1949. And I said, how would you remember that? And how would you remember the year? And she said, the beans were awful good that year. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And but you I sat in with that quilt group and uh, wrote about them, how women were still quilting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. 
How did you make the the transition from journalism in particular? If you were you, I don't know if you were writing uh, mostly on business or if you were a features writer for business. I, I don't know how. That I, I was pure chief, so I wrote everything. Okay, uh, but I did do a lot of. Um, uh, I guess you call them features. Okay. And I, I like to, I covered uh, mining and, and uh, uh, a lot of business elements. And then from there, did you, I know you have published nonfiction, I think history. I had, I'd written yeah. 10 books primarily on the history of the West. Mm -hmm. And I always thought I would do that uh, when I got older and write books on them, you know, land development, and water use, and all those critical issues. And one day, uh, two friends and I decided that we would write a bodice buster. And we were all three of us writers, and we assigned characters, and we wrote part of that book. But when we got together, we realized our styles didn't mesh. And uh, um, the uh, uh, one writer was a ski writer, and her stuff sounded like a travelogue. And another was a, uh, and I, my uh, writing sounded like a, an annual report. And there was a woman who wrote for People Magazine, and she had all these one word sentences like, wow. And so <laughs> the styles just didn't gel. <laughs> but out of that, I learned you know, how what fun I had writing fiction. And so I pulled out a novel I had written after college that I knew was perfectly awful. And I'd never even reread it. Um, I dumped it in a drawer and it sat there for years. And I I rewrote it and I sent it off to my agent. And she said, well, I like this, but it's not publishable. Hmm. And she uh, and I kept rewriting it over the years. And finally, one day she said, Sandra, what's wrong with that is those characters are all unlikable. So I made them all likable and the book eventually <laughs> was published uh, on uh, the title was the, uh, the chili queen. Oh, was and so, my fifth novel. Oh, that's, and, but that was a revision of a book that you wrote after college or during college. Uh, yes. Oh, I started out writing it probably in my thirties. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. The unlikable character. We both write for children. And I remember sending my, my editor a book that I thought was, well, brilliant, but also kind of edgy because, you know, I mean, which middle grade fiction really shouldn't be. But but the main character was unlikable. And she said, you can't do it. You can't, uh -huh. especially, not, especially not with kids. But I think it, it can be hard to pull off even when you're writing literary fiction for adults. Um, it, it's hard. It's harder for readers um, to, to have a main character that they don't connect with on some level. So that's interesting that you went back and uh, made those characters more relatable and likable. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think you're right. I think readers do want characters they can relate to and they want to think they are like certain characters. Mm -hmm. And who wants to think you're like one of the bad guys? Right. Right. <laughs> or are you just, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's complicated, but um, you think about that, even there can be the, the secondary characters can be, unlikable or ridiculous or what have you, but I think you need someone steady in the middle. So, well, that's one of my questions for you is um, what kind of characters are you drawn to as a writer? I mean, because when you write a novel, you spend a lot of time with that protagonist. Who do you like spending time with? I think what you've said about likable characters applies to the author as well. You don't, I don't want to spend a year or more with somebody I don't like. So my characters are people I like, and they tend to be strong women, but women within their time period. Um, I think there are universal truths that, uh, as I think women throughout history have resented uh, the, their lack of power. Mm. Um, the fact that they are relegated to um, second-class citizens. Um, but they respond to that in their own way, not in, in a way that we would look at today. A woman would not stand up uh, to uh, uh, a man in the uh, 
uh, 12th century and demand certain rights. She had no rights. Mm. Um, so I write about characters, say, in the 19th century, women who want what they considered equality, but it was, say, being on the school board rather than being president of the United States. You look at characters within their own time period rather than apply um, 21st standard characteristics to them. Mm -hmm. I noticed I was rereading, is it the diary of Maddie Spencer? Yes. 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 And that's an interesting book and it's interesting reading it uh, from this vantage point in the 21st century. I mean, 20, you know, what year are we now? 2024, because I feel like the way that she, her feelings and, and the way that she responds, like when the, their wagon train is attacked, by a small band of, of Native Americans and Indians, that it's it's a fascinating scene in terms of what you're talking about. It's like she very much downplays the fact that she can shoot. She's she's quite skilled, and I mean, she does say she's afraid and she cried, and you know, I mean, it, I mean, a lot was going on in that one scene, but that but she does she doesn't put herself forward as a hero, even though she fought quite bravely. But also, I, I think that she she was afraid of these people attacking and she did not like them. And I think that that, that felt very real to me in a way that some some readers in the 21st century are like, well, yeah, well, would find unacceptable, but I find very realistic. Well, thank you. That That's the way I hoped it would be read that for her own time, her, she was embarrassed that she had done that. She was um, uh, she was a little proud of it, yeah. but uh, wouldn't have said anything to anybody and would not have taken credit for it. Yeah. And today we're totally different. Yeah, and it bothers me when those twenty first uh, century characteristics are given to women in history and in novels. What yeah, it's what I call the Doctor Quinn Medicine Woman syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes very that's a great yes it's very much that and it's um you know i remember reading it's like the that if you want to learn a <laughs> You can read historical fiction to understand the attitudes of the time it was written in, <laughs> not yes, just what yes. it was written about. So, um, yes. but that, but but that's why I really appreciated reading Maddie Spencer. I felt she felt authentic. I mean, she did feel strong, and she is brave, but she also was checking herself. You know, she was bare, and even in the way that she deals with her husband, she's, um, she's, yeah. So she, I feel, embodies. A, a woman of her time, um, and you know, and she she feels when there is a crisis in her life, and she begins to look around at at um, alternatives. She realizes that she has none. Yeah, that she is married, and being unmarried, if she left her husband, what would she do? She could be a teacher and earn a, a pittance. Yeah, and live with a family while she was teaching and. Uh, or she could be a domestic, which was horrible work. Mm -hmm. And women, women had no options. Yeah, I think it's. I think that we take a lot of what was uh, hard won and ha hard fought for for granted. You know, uh -huh. so uh -huh. you whip out your credit card, nothing to it, and you know. But it wasn't that long ago. No, uh, I was yeah. when I married. My uh, credit cards were canceled. Right, and that's shocking to us now. But that wasn't uh -huh. that long ago. So, uh, well, well, let's get to quilting in your books, because as we've established, these are not books about quilting bees. They're not like, let's let's explore quilting through historical fiction. It's like quilting was part of these women's lives. What function do quilts and quilt making serve in your stories? Why, why are they there? Um, you write about my books that they're not quilt novels. I write novels that happen to have quilting in them. And quilting was a way of drawing women together. Uh, it was a way of, uh, they could socialize. They always, women couldn't just get together and talk and play bridge or, or uh, chat the way men did. They had to have some function that was worthwhile. And so making bed covers served that, that purpose. But it was a social way of women, particularly rural women, of getting together and talking. 
and make and relating. In the case of Maddie Spencer, um, she had her neighbors were far away. She never saw women except when they could get together for a quilting bee. Mm -hmm. So it served that function for me. Um, quilting is women's art. When women were not encouraged to do other things, they turned to quilting to express themselves. And they had beautiful uh, quilts that were just works of art. And there were also questions in the quilts. I have one that's uh, cheddar yellow and that pink and, and brown. And uh, it's a baby quilt, beautifully put together. In the corner is one little blue piece. And you wonder if she ran out of fabric and couldn't afford more, or maybe she had moved on and the fabric wasn't available. But there's a story there. And another quilt I have is actually signed with initials and the date. And you knew that while most quilts were anonymous, this quilt maker was so proud of what she had done that she wanted to record her name and, and when she had made it. Mm -hmm. And so quilts tell stories. And that's what I like about historic quilts, uh, not so much with contemporary quilts, is there always seem to be stories in them. I have one quilt that I bought in a, a, a secondhand shop that was, uh, it was well made. It had never been washed. It was a, a friendship quilt, and it had all the women's names embroidered in it. Um, I think it was the 1880s, maybe. Um, and the wonderful names, and I used all those names in one of my books, Alice's Tulips. All the characters' names come from that quilt. Oh, that's marvelous. Oh, I love that. And did you, did you keep the, did you have the quilt? Was, was yes, that yes. Collection? And every now and then it's displayed. Yeah. Quilt museum. It's so interesting, this idea that you had a, kind of a prop. Did that quilt, in, did you feel like, like when you, I assume that when you look at it, you think of these characters. Did I, I guess I'm trying, what I'm trying to get at is did having that quilt, did it make the characters more, real for you or did it put the quilt in a story and make the quilt more uh, no it, it did make the characters real because i wanted to call the book alice's tulips which is a quilt pattern mm -hmm. and it turned out that there was an, an alice in in the uh, quilt uh one of the makers of one of the quilt squares was alice and so uh, that was very easy to get that name another yeah. quote that i've used in a book is um an 18, I think 1861 or two American flag quilt that was in, um, oh, not Goaty's Ladies Book, but what's the other one? But anyway, this was a hand, there was a hand colored plate um, in the, the book showing the colors of the quilt and the design of the quilt. It was stripes and, and stars and, and uh, I found a quilt made from that pattern in a quilt shop or in an antique store. Mm. And so I bought that and I used that in one of my books. Oh, I love that idea so much of having the quilt on hand as you're writing. And I, I mean, and we could get woo woo with it in, <laughs> in the spirits of the quilt. But, but <laughs> I always, you know, I think that every, every quilt has a story um, and I'm always uh, gonna, as part of the Quilt Alliance, always encouraging people to to label their quilts so we can know more about that story that's in the quilt. But it's also um, there. There's some quilts that you just stand in front of them, and you the, there's something you feel something from them, and it's 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 quite interesting to me. You do, and you wonder about the person who made them, mm -hmm. and and the circumstances, and where she got the fabrics, and if she she traded them, or if she uh, somehow or had enough money to buy new fabric or yeah. she made them out of old clothes and and why did she pick this pattern and they do tell stories yeah. and you can make up stories about them which is nice yes it is nice I don't know if you're familiar with Gwen Marston um, who's a wonderful quilter but also a quilt historian and she when she got into quilt making in the 70s she started looking at quilts from the particularly the 19th century and early 20th century and they're so they're so individualistic, even when 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 the quilters used patterns. They made variations that appealed to them. They made it personal. Mm -hmm. And their their own quilt. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I love seeing that. And I love seeing the oddities in, in, in people's quilts, not so much my own. I have one quilt where the, the block is actually upside down. The wrong, it's wrong side up. And oh. uh, why she went ahead and quilted it that way, I don't know. Surely at some point she would have realized it and she could have changed the block, but she yeah, didn't. But she didn't. And maybe she just thought, maybe it tickled her. <laughs> or maybe it made someone mad in a way that made her happy. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't know with people now so for our our book of the month for quilt fiction quilt fiction club is going to be the persian pickle club uh, i know a, a number of people in the group have read the persian pickle club but it's such a it's it's a great starter book for the for people who have not read your work um but i would love to know what what is your most recent book i feel like you had a book that has come out in the last couple of years and also what you're working on I um, had a book that came out in April called Where Coyotes Howl. Mm -hmm. And the Diary of Maddie Spencer was always my favorite of my books. Wow. But this one is is now my favorite. Um, it's a story of a woman who goes to uh, Wyoming about 1915 as a teacher. And she's offered this position kind of, uh, she applied for it. She saw an ad for it and applied, having no idea that she'd be accepted. She she was a teacher in Iowa at the time. And she thought, well, it would be a lark to go to Wyoming. She'd read Zane Gray. And so she thought that there were beautiful mountains and, and uh, rushing streams. And, and when she got there, it's an eastern, the town is in eastern Wyoming. She was dumbfounded at the brown, at the, the, the prairie grasses, at the, the ugliness of the town. And uh, um, she uh, stays in a uh, she boards with a family. She assumed that there would be a, a nice boarding house with other women. There's no such thing like that. And she boards with a family. But the man is very cruel and very objectionable. Um, uh, the book editor at the Denver Post reviewed the book and, and said, all of your men are jerks. And I, I emailed back and I said, yeah, but aren't all men jerks? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the the woman uh, teaches, and um, uh, she's made a commitment of a year, and she'll live with it, meets a handsome cowboy, and uh, at the end of the school year, they're married. It's a story of the challenges and the struggles of, particularly of women in the West, of how they leave everything behind, um, uh, social structures, um, uh, uh, church friendships uh, and how difficult it is for them facing these horrible blizzards and um, uh, heat in the summer. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's, it's a love story more than anything I've, I've written in it. And it's a story of how this couple has enough love that they can get through these difficulties, mm -hmm. but not all of women can do this. There's a character who has a, a baby year after year and a husband who's pretty much worthless. And she finally goes crazy just listening to the wind of the challenge of the children, one of whom is, is uh, uh, mentally uh, challenged. Um, and it's, it's as much as I can make it, it's a very accurate picture of life in that prairie. And there is much hardship in it. Mm -hmm. And it's um, there's there's death and there's um, there's just it's just very difficult. Um, but again, it's because these two people love each other that they can put up with all of this. Um, and a lot of ways, I think it's it's the best of my books because it's I I write about women in a way. I like to portray women, and I think the book accurately depicts the challenges that women faced. Hmm. What is the kind of research you do? Are you looking at diaries and letters and that? How, how, well, I did to a certain extent. I, I know the West. I've yeah. covered it as a reporter, mm -hmm. and I've written about Western history. Right. So I had an idea of what this was about. It turned yeah. out that when I started the book, it was the beginning of COVID. And my husband had been quite early, been in the hospital and, and came home 
uh, literally the day COVID uh, restrictions went in. Goodness. So we couldn't uh, go to Wyoming and see what the landscape was like, mm-hmm. even though I'd been there before. I couldn't do that. I couldn't go to the library and do research. So most of it was my own books oh, or right. online. And I have probably 100 women's journals. So I um, was able to use a lot of the, the books that I already had to do the research. I've got some uh, some uh, anthologies, uh, like you know, Westward Journey journals. They're very hard to read. I feel I just read them going, I would never do this. I could never do this. It's it's an amazing thing, almost uh, psychologically and emotionally. Um, that we'll- and yet, the West gave women something. It it took a lot away from them, but if they could cope with that, they had the freedom that they never would have had in the East. And mm-hmm. the love of the land, the beauty of the the openness mm-hmm. um, that that there really was something there uh, for them. What kind of woman came from the east and thr- thrived, throve, thrived in the west? Who was going to make it? Who was going to really, truly find her fully human self in the west? Well, a lot of women had no choice to mm-hmm. go west. They didn't right. choose it. Their husband chose it, and their alternative was to stay at home, trying to figure out how to um, keep themselves alive. I think so. Many of those women were challenged; they had no no choice, and so they did do well in the West. I think the women who really thrived—is that the yeah. word? <laughs> I don't think it's drove. <laughs> I don't think so. Don't think so. Uh, who did well in the West? <laughs> Were those probably who were a little um, uh, repressed, felt repressed in mm-hmm. the East, mm-hmm. um, felt um, uh, tied down by the restrictions under which they lived yeah. and were able to be more themselves, if you will, when they came West. They had more opportunities, um, whether they wanted to or not. Uh, they had to be strong women. They had to work. They had to um, uh, help plow the fields, to work in the mining camps. Um, I think the reason that Colorado was the first state to give women the vote and Wyoming was the first territory was that a husband couldn't say, honey, it's okay if you plow the field alongside me and and fight the grasshoppers and all that, but God forbid you should be unsexed by being allowed to vote. I think women earn their right to vote out here. Hmm. What is a a novel of the West, not not one of your own, that has been important to you and you would recommend to someone's like, okay, I'm gonna read all of Sanders' books, but when I finish this, <laughs> what's um I always like Wallace Stegner's books. Oh yeah. He writes so much about how the land forms the people. Mm-hmm. And he writes about essentially the, the last of the uh, of those people who came west in Big Rock Candy Mountain. He, he writes about uh, his family who, who uh, uh, were homesteading uh, at the very end of the, the Western expansion uh, and what the West did to them. That's Big Rock Candy Mountain by Wallace Stegner, S-T-E-G-N-E-R. S-E-G, yeah. Yeah. He won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, Angle of Repose. And that's what I've read of his. And that's that's based on the diary of Mary Halleck Foote. All right. So that's another one. Everyone who's listening, who's looking for novels of the West, Angle of Repose by Stegner. And I guess I will do show notes and make sure that all of um, these things appear there so you can you can look further into them. So finally, um, I know a lot of our listeners have children and grandchildren and are always looking for books, especially for middle grade readers. I think everybody, you know, it, it feels pretty comfortable picking out the, the picture books. But when it comes to middle grade, it's harder. And and I, I believe that's the that is the age group sort of fifth through seventh, eighth grade that you write for. Yes. And, and I'd love for you to just uh, pick one of those books um, that you, you think anyone's kid would love to read. Um, probably someplace to call home, uh, which has gotten a number of awards. 
it's about a um, brother and sister who are, in essence, orphans. Uh, he's about 15 and she's 13. And, and they have a brother who probably has Down syndrome, but it's not recognized. And they have taken off uh, to go to California during the Dust Bowl. Their mm -hmm. mother has just died. Relatives would split up the three of them uh, if they took in, uh, took them in. And so they have decided to go to California. This is not one of those cute, let's make it develop, you know, let's, let's go find Pa in California books, but it's, it's pretty serious. And they break down in Kansas and they camp uh, in a field. Um, a man comes along with a shotgun and says, you're, you're camping on my land. And they get to talking. And then the man looks at the little boy, Benny, who is, has Down syndrome. And uh, brother and sister are very defensive of this little boy. And the man finally says, uh, uh, why don't you come over to my house tomorrow? Turns out he has a little girl who has Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so they make friends. And the man allows them to camp on the land. But there are a number of people who are opposed to their being there, who uh, feel that uh, times are really hard and jobs should go to local people if there are jobs. And it's the girl, it's, it's told from the standpoint of the girl, and she <laughs> is um, determined to find some place to call home. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, um, my books are not sweet books. They have, challenges and hardships in them but again they are how people triumph uh about children who mature um during the um uh, during the time of the book mm -hmm. um i this was kind of nice i i got last week a packet of 50 letters from girls in a hebrew school in cleveland and their teacher had taught them was teaching them how to write letters. And so they had just read my book in class and she decided they would write letters to me. And so I had 50 letters from these girls who who, really, who know how to spell, which really shocked me. Um, <laughs> and they were beautifully written. The grammar was good. And and uh, and I thought, well, I'll write a um, just one letter to the whole class. And then I thought, no, if they've written me letters, I they deserve individual replies so I wrote letters to them but they all told me how much they liked the book and it was interesting to me because they told me what the parts of the book that they liked and I had never gotten that kind of feedback before hmm. uh, other than you know just just now and then yeah and they liked the cliffhangers at the end of the chapters and they liked when uh, a car was stolen and found they liked when Benny was lost and the whole community found him and uh, it, it was really interesting to read all of that. Oh, that's great. And that's, uh, it's it's nice that they were that specific about, and also what great feedback. So for the next book, you're like, all right, cliffhangers, remember that. And can, <laughs> <laughs> that's what, and it's interesting that, that you're, that you write for an adult audience as well as, as children, because uh, there are things that you can quote unquote, get away with with adults. There's, you can get into uh, to some interiority that kids are like, let's keep this going, please. It's not like you can't have thoughtful characters who who have interesting uh, internal dialogues, but, but yeah, the, the kids will ask, they, they want, they want. It to was really interesting to me to, to start writing children's books. I was approached by a publisher to do it. And I had tried writing a children's book and, and, uh, uh hadn't, uh, uh, I mean, it was, I knew it was no good. And um, uh, working with an editor, I realized what you can do with children. For instance, I had a girl shoot somebody and my editor said, no, the children cannot shoot. <laughs> An adult has to shoot the person. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to hear from them too. When you hear from an adult reader, it's always a very nice note saying how much they like your book and they ask a question about something or other. But when you hear from kids, um, they tell you what the sequel should be yes. and put hearts all over the letter. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just very personal. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they mean it. They really mean it. So, well, that's great. So 
you have a, a very informative website. So people listening to this who are ready to get on the Sandra Dallas train can go to your website, which I think is it just sandradallas.com. Right. Yeah. And well, I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. Um, and it's great because all your the books are laid out, all the, the are laid out in a very nice way, very easy to uh pick and choose. Um, it is, it's kind of like a box of candy, really. It's really well done. So um, I, I, it's exciting to talk to you. I have been a big fan of your work for a long time, and it's always exciting when a quilt does show up. And uh, it's not too long ago that you actually, there was a Christmas quilt, which was nice holiday reading. Um, so that's that, but, but I just, I think your books are wonderful and the, the characters are really compelling and I want to, you know, and I care about them. And that I think is a hard thing for a writer to do. And, and, as we were discussing earlier, perhaps the most important thing is to have a character. You care what happens to them and you want to follow them all the way through the arc of their story. So it's been lovely talking to you and um, and hearing about your quilts. And I'm, I'm fascinated by I'm an, uh, the, the doll quilts. I'd, I'd love to learn more about them. And maybe um, I'll email you after this and, and perhaps get some pictures, of, get you to send some pictures of the quilts in your, some of the quilts in your collection. Uh, so that the, our listeners can see them. And I would love to see them as well, but I sure appreciate your time. Um, and oh, thank this you has so been much. fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and, and the next time you have a book, uh, let me know. I will get you back on. So thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you to Sandra for taking the time to do that interview with me. I had so much fun talking to her. She's just warm and funny and smart. And, you know, she's a really, really good writer. And um, I, I, if you haven't read her work, now is the time to start. I hope the interview has inspired you to go pick up a few of Sandra's books and get reading. Now, I wanted to share with you a bit from Sandra's forward to the 20th anniversary edition of the Persian Pickle Club. What I'm about to read gives us some insight to how Sandra got her idea for the story, and it also pays tribute to the quilting and sewing bees and women of long ago. So I've got the book right here. Uh, this is homemade radio, so you may hear some pages um, doing whatever it is pages do when they're being turned, making a little noise. Okay, let me read. Okay, here we go. Writing about quilting wasn't my goal when I hit on the idea for the Persian Pickle Club. I was lying in a hammock in Breckenridge, Colorado, watching my husband Bob chop and stack wood and decided that to justify my laziness, I had to come up with a plot for a novel. I got to thinking about a story my mother had told me about the first year of my folks' marriage during the depth of the Depression. That was 1933. Both mom and dad, who had been married in Moline, Illinois, lost their jobs at Kresge's Dime Store. Dad suggested they could move to my grandparents' farm in Harveyville, Kansas, and earn their keep by helping Grandma and Grandpa Dallas. One day, a neighbor offered Dad a day's work in the field and said he'd pay a dollar. Dad worked so hard that he finished by noon and earned just 50 cents, the only money he made all that summer. Mom loved my grandparents and enjoyed attending Grandma's sewing circle, where she made a pink and green double wedding ring quilt, the only quilt she ever pieced. But farm life was not for her, and one day she told Dad she was going into Topeka to find a job and wouldn't come back until she got one. That's exactly what she did. Later, Mom was offered a temporary job with the newly created Social Security Administration in Washington, D.C., and when the position became permanent, Dad joined her. The story of Mom and Dad's summer in Kansas, along with a murder, could be the basis of a novel, I thought, lying there in the hammock. I could write about the Depression and how it challenged women. But I needed something to tie the characters together, and that's when I came up with the idea of a quilt circle. Tom and Rita, of course, are based on Mom and Dad, although my folks were much nicer. Mrs. Ritter is Grandma Dallas, and the Ritter Farm is the Dallas Farm, which burned down years ago. 
I've never lived in Kansas, but I've spent time there. My older sister, Donna, my brother Michael, and I were born in Washington, D.C. After we moved to Denver when I was six, we drove over two-lane highways to Harveyville for summer vacations and Thanksgiving holidays. I remember walking barefoot down the dirt road into town, fishing for crawdads, and picking black walnuts, which Grandma used in her Christmas divinity. And I remember the chili Grandma kept hot on the cook stove for our arrival in November. We slept on feather beds and sometimes woke in the morning to find that snow had sifted through the cracks in the walls onto the quilts Grandma made. Those memories became part of the novel. Okay, I'm going to skip forward a few paragraphs. Until the mid-20th century, women were rarely encouraged to excel in the fine arts. Those who bucked tradition generally were not considered artists, but female artists. So with the fine arts all but closed to them, women used their artistic ability to add beauty to everyday crafts, including quilts. A quilt composed of big patches of mismatched material kept a person just as warm as one made up of tiny fabric scraps arranged in an intricate design. But to quilters like those in Grandma's sewing circle, a quilt was more than a bed cover, and they spent hours piecing their tops, then attaching them to backing and batting with stitches as fine as flax seeds. For rural women, whose hands were never idle, quilting was a social activity, a way to justify getting together to share their lives. In her 1933 diary, Mom wrote, went to club with Mom today, sewed, gossiped, and ate enough for two men. And again, went to club with Mom, helped quilt. They are all good women. Like all quilt groups, Grandma's club was practical. The members traded scraps instead of buying new fabric, and sometimes they ran out of a color and made do. I have a baby quilt of cheddar yellow, double pink, and brown, with one tiny piece of blue where the quilter ran out of fabric. Despite the fact that the quilts were utilitarian objects meant to be used up, their makers were proud of their work. My indigo and white quilt purchased at an antique show is embroidered with, on the underside with C.A.C. 1884. I wish C.A.C. knew how beloved this quilt is 130 years later. Y'all, the entire forward of the Persian Pickle Club is well worth reading. It's a really wonderful story. And, um... I want to remind you, again, we're giving away a copy of the Persian Persian Pickle Club to one lucky listener, so pop over to quiltfiction.com and enter to win. Because the Persian Pickle Club is set in Kansas, this block, this month's block of the month, and I don't think I've mentioned, but I'll mention it now, we're going to do a block of the month every month, just for fun. Let's give it a shot. But this month's block of the month is the Rocky Road to Kansas, which is a paper piece block, which is made out of strings, which is to say leftover strips of fabric. And what it looks like, if you've not seen one, is a really colorful, stripy, pointed star. And check out Quilt Fiction on Instagram uh, for photos. I'm going to put some up there. I have been doing some paper piece stars myself. It's really fun. I love I love wonky stuff. And what I love about this block is it's wonky, but it also has uh, a formality to it, right? It's, it's a star. It's a four-pointed star. So there's wonkiness, but there's also design. There's also a specific shape and geometry. And I really like the juxtaposition of those two things. Anyway, so whenever I am interested in getting a quilt or a quilt block's back history, I go to Barbara Brackman's blog. Probably a lot of you are familiar with her. She is uh, one of our premier quilt historians. And she, she has a great blog. If you're interested in quilt history, I highly recommend it. Barbara is great. I wanted to know more about the Rocky Road to Kansas 
block. So, of course, I looked it up on Barbara's blog. And there's not a ton of information. Um, there was a pattern company back in the day called the Ladies Art Company. And they published patterns and kits. And they published um, a pattern, two variations of the Rocky Road to Kansas pattern in around 1890. And one of the things that you'll see, and if you go to Barbara's blog, you'll see this. So many of these uh, Rocky Road to Kansas blocks were made in crazy quilt style. So instead of just strings sewn together, you know, strips of fabric, wonky strips of fabric sewn together in rows and then, you know, cut, there were like strips that are parallel to each other and perpendicular to each other and just, and yeah, and it just feels very, very crazy quiltish. And I guess some of the fabrics are crazy quilt-esque, which is to say silk and velvet. It's interesting. There are plenty of ones that are, that are like the ones that I've been making, which are just strips sewn together, cut out, and then paper pieced. And it is a paper pieced block. I can't remember if I mentioned that. And I know that people are wary of paper piecing, but I think this is a great block to start with if you've ever wanted to learn. And I haven't done it at this recording, but I'm about to do it this weekend. I'm going to do a video, a demo which should be hilarious. I advise you I, to tune in to, the, it's the Quilt Fiction YouTube channel, and that's where I'll post it. And just if you wanna feel better about yourself, your own quilting abilities, what have you, come in and watch, because one, this will be the first time I've ever <laughs> recorded a demo of me doing some quilting. Two, I am a backwards quilter. Uh, I am an imperfectionist. So anyway, I'm gonna do this. And my motto is, if I can make this block, you can make this block. If I can paper piece, you can paper piece. And you might already know how to paper piece. And by the way, if you do, you can go to quiltfiction.com and go into the patterns section, I believe, and there will be a PDF of uh, of the paper piecing pattern. You can print it out and make copies. Yeah, and make your own a Rocky Road to Kansas. If you do, please, and you have an Instagram account, post it, tag us, all that good stuff. We're gonna close up now. I think we've had enough Francis fun for one month, but I do hope that February is a great month for you. It's a leap. We've got a leap year here, so it's going to be not a long month. <laughs> Nothing's going to be long compared to this past January, which was over yesterday and was gloomy and dreary, and um, I'm glad to say goodbye to it. I do hope that February is a great month of reading and quilting for you. Uh, my reading goal this year is to read three books a month. Last year, it was two books, and I ended up averaging three and a, a few on the side. So this year I'm going for three and, and hoping to read more. And it's funny, I am a, a lifelong serious reader, but like a lot of people, the uh, internet and social media and all of that have ruined my brain. And so now <laughs> I'm trying to put some brackets around that. I know that once I open my laptop, and you know, I'm a writer, I spend all day uh, staring at Google Docs. I, I write my drafts uh, in Google Docs. And so my, my computer is always on. And once I open it up, I'm going to, of course, check email. I'm going to see what's going on in the Quilt Fiction, face, uh, Quilt Fiction Club, which is Quilt Fiction's Facebook group, which is the nicest place on Facebook if you're looking for some place really pleasant and sweet and funny and interesting to land. I recommend the, uh, the Quilt Fiction Club. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, so I have to check. I have to see if anyone has said anything interesting over in the Quilt Fiction Club. I go check Instagram. Once that starts, I'm not going to settle back down into any serious reading until I go to bed. And I, I read for about an hour before I go to bed. So I, starting last year, I just, I bracketed it off. When I get up, I get my coffee and I try to read for at least 30 minutes. Uh, if not an hour, and I am very serious about finishing my books, you know, and unless I, I mean, I don't have to finish a book I'm not enjoying, but I do have to finish books that I am enjoying or finding worthwhile. Sometimes you cannot necessarily enjoy a book, but you can still feel like, yeah, I, I, I think I want, yeah, you know, this is a good book to read. I'm getting something out of it. Perhaps not pure joy. <laughs> 
but something. Anyway, so that that worked for me. That made a big difference last year, and it's making a difference this year. So, uh, and and in January, I actually January, I actually read five books. A couple of them were short. One was super short. It was The Mysteries by Bill Watterson, who uh, is the the. Uh, comic artist who is responsible for Calvin and Hobbes, and that's a super short book. I also read uh, Goodbye, Mr. Chips for the Quilt Fiction Club's 1930s book club. That was short, uh, sweet. It was, it, was a, it, uh, it, was, it was a lovely book to read. So that helped. That's why my account is so high for January. My favorite January read was the novel North Woods by Daniel Mason. It's a hard book to describe. It all centers around a, a farmhouse, a piece of land, and I think it's in western Massachusetts. But, the, I mean, it begins like in the, the 1700s, maybe even earlier, and then goes through the present. And every chapter is someone the next person who has come to this land, moved into the cabin, built a farm. You know, it's like it goes through generations. Um, and and I loved it. It kind of is a book that, I mean, it's, it's a hard conceit. It's a hard thing to pull off. It's kind of this sort of linked short stories all are, you know all set in the same place and there's back and forth. It, it, it's a hard thing to pull off and toward the end. I thought I, I kind of was losing interest, but the last two chapters were so, so good. So I loved that. The two books I'm looking forward to reading next are The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride and a book I just learned about the other day and I'm so excited about. Um, I, I'm not going to buy it because I know it's probably not. Yeah, it's a book. It's, it's a ve- it sounds like a very cozy read. Um, I don't think it's a book that I'll read over and over. Um, and right, right now, it's just it's just out, so it's only out in hardback. But I am in line at the library, and here's one of my tricks now. And this especially works since um, I'm about to turn 60, and my eyes aren't what they used to be. When I put put a book on hold, if they've got it in large print. I put it on hold for large print. One, I actually really love large print books. um, They they are so easy to read. But two, there's usually a much shorter line. Now, it's just occurred to me as I've been talking to you that I am taking the books out of a hand of a senior. On the other hand, I myself am almost a senior. Yes. And I think when I go to Harris to the grocery store in June, I turn 60 on May 30th, I think I get the senior discount if I go on Thursdays. And the all the young checkout people, like the ones who are like under 30 um, and really the ones who are under 25, for the last couple years, they've been asking me if I go, if I'm grocery shopping on a Thursday, they're like, now, do you get the senior discount? And for, um, you know, for a little while, that really bugged me. And now I'm like, yeah, I mean, do you, do you need to see ID? If you don't need to see ID, see ID, I will take the senior discount. So I have this book, Mrs. Quinn's Rise to Fame. It's by Olivia Ford. I think I have that name right. And it is essentially a story of an older woman who competes on a great British Bake Off style show in the UK. I adore the great British Bake Off. There are seasons I have watched so many times if they were VHS tapes, they would have been worn out by now. And so I just could not think of a book that is more up my alley. And I did read the sample on Amazon, and it, it, it's, it looks very well written. And um, so I'm excited about that for February. And it's, you know, what is better in February than reading a cozy British novel about baking, about baking? I'm really, I'm really excited. Okay. That is it for this month on the Quilt Fiction Podcast. Once again, I want to thank Sandra Dallas for taking the time to talk to us about her books and her writing. I just I enjoyed that so much. We will be back in March with more Quilt Fiction. We'll have new books and blocks of the month and another fantastic giveaway. So be sure to tune in. Thanks again to Aliso for sponsoring this episode. Which reminds me, don't forget to head over to quiltfiction.com to enter. Thank you for listening, and see you next month. Bye for now.